You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is 692411. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no. The company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green... whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. Right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Now listen to their conversation. Anything else that we can help you with? Um, uh, let me think. What else do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Uh, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar, then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't, but could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 2. Part 2 You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up ten years ago by myself, John, and my then-girlfriend and now-wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So... Five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps in convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8am and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2pm to 6pm, and then evening ones, 7pm to 11pm. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. 
These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation among two students and their tutor about the presentation they are going to make at the tutorial class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Right, Jason and Karen, uh, how are your presentations for the next tutorial class? Um, I feel a bit nervous. I haven't done that before. Although many of my classmates in the same tutorial group have finished theirs. But I think them a little uninteresting because they just read out their notes. I hope mine will be more attractive it and... seems you have a higher demand for yourself. As for me, I have no sense of uneasiness because I made one last semester. But I feel no sense of satisfaction about it. It lacked strong arguments, I think. How much did you get for the last presentation, Jason? Eighty-three mm, percent, actually. But my goal for the next one is over eighty-seven percent. It's pretty good. What is your topic for this one? Uh, strategies for reading. I feel my biggest problem is in the reading speed, rather than vocabulary, which is most students' problem, though. I am slow, especially in reading articles on my f major courses. They are complex and dull. Mm, have you found any effective methods? Well, I am not quite sure. I suppose to skim the books or articles is a... Uh, good approach. Yes, by skimming the book first you get the choicest parts. It saves a lot of time. You don't have to read every word of the passage, but you have to learn to read certain parts intensively. Yes, I include that in my presentation. There is one thing I'm not clear yet. Why don't we make presentations more related to our major? Once you learn to write clearly, read analytically, and listen to lectures effectively, You'll begin professional tutorials. That means you should start from the basics. Well, Karen, how is your presentation? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Oh, Karen, how is your presentation? I am still in a panic. I want to find some more interesting topics about writing, but I wonder what articles I can refer to, because there are so many of them. Did you get the list of the reading materials handed out last class? 
Yes, but there are over twenty on it. I have only a week to prepare, so I wonder if okay. We could... Let me give you some suggestions. You needn't read them all because some of them deal with the same issue. The article by Hallsworth is really worth reading. It covers the aspects of organizing the thoughts and ideas. Okay, Hallsworth. You should also read the article by Jackson. But just look at the part on research methodology. Now, how they did it. Right, I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Fisher. But just look at the part on the writing plan. That is how to plan your writing in a systematical way. Okay, Fisher, got that.、Um, and if you have time, the one by Risewell says very relevant things. It teaches how to title your articles and make it appealing. You should finish the whole book. Okay. Now the one by Burns. If I were you, I wouldn't bother with the whole passage. Just read the conclusion, which summarizes the use of rhetoric. Oh, now I understand. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a biology lecture about tubularia. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. I'm glad so many people have shown up here today to hear about these fascinating little creatures called the Turbellaria. My name is Dr. Baker, and I've spent twenty years researching thousands of different species of platyhelminths, what are commonly known as flatworms, both free-living and parasitic. So there are a lot of things I could tell you about these extremely interesting invertebrates, but I will try to keep it short. Turbellaria are unique amongst flatworms in three ways. The first one is that unlike 80% of all platyhelminths, turbellaria do not need to secure nourishment from a living source. This means that they do not generally parasitize a host, but are instead found living freely in the environment. So no need to worry about any of these little samples I've got here escaping and causing havoc. The second way in which they're different is that they are, well, they're incredibly simple, and by simple I don't mean in terms of structure, as their structure is indeed quite complex, and I'll get to that later. By simple, I mean that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Flatworms in general are not known for their cognitive abilities. Especially when compared with other invertebrates such as cuttlefish or octopuses or even insects, but amongst flatworms, turbellaria are by far the most primitive of the bunch. Finally, and this is a direct result of the first thing I mentioned, turbellaria tend to have a much more complicated sensory system in their head region. This includes a set of eyes with receptors that can detect light, as well as chemical sensory organs that assist turbellaria in locating food. Obviously, as other flatworms receive nutrition directly from their host, they have no need for this. Despite these three differences, however, turbellaria are quite similar to other flatworms in all sorts of other ways. First of all, as their name suggests, they're incredibly flat, which allows them to hide under stones. 
They're symmetrical on both sides, and they don't have a body cavity. They also don't have any specialized respiratory, skeletal, and circulatory systems. What they do have, however, and this is what I meant when I referenced their structure before, is three layers known as the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, as well as a head region where their brain and sense organs are located, and a spongy connective tissue that fills all the space between their organs. Finally, like most species of flatworms, they're hermaphrodites. This means that a single flatworm has a set of each gender. But don't take this to mean they reproduce alone. Their preferred method of reproduction is called cross-fertilization, which means that each flatworm fertilizes the other. I mentioned before that most flatworms need a host, but turbellaria feed from the environment. So what do they feed on? Most turbellaria can be found either in fresh or salt water, and they feed on small insects, microscopic matter, and crustaceans. They will pretty much eat anything they find. They have no preference on whether their food is living or dead. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, if they ever find themselves in a situation where food is scarce, they might also feed on themselves. That's right, they'll start eating their own body, starting with the least essential muscles and organs and working their way up. They will shrink in size until they're able to find food again, at which point they'll begin to regenerate everything they've lost. One final thing about food, and apologies in advance if I disgust you, Turbillaria don't possess an anus, which means that their mouth, which is a muscular opening on the underside of their body, has to serve as one. Before I finish this presentation, one more thing you've probably heard before but weren't sure if it was a myth or not. I mentioned already that turbillaria can reproduce on their own, but there's a second method they can use, which is known as fission. Now, as a child, you were probably told that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two new worms. That's not entirely true, but flatworms are not worms exactly, and they do have the ability to regenerate by splitting into two, perhaps even more smaller parts, at which point each part regrows the missing organs and becomes a brand new turbillarian. Now, this is extremely important for us, and this is how I'd like to close this presentation because their ability to regenerate endlessly makes them virtually immortal, and it might open pathways to regeneration in human cells or slowing the human aging process, which is why scientists like myself have been studying these unique creatures, hoping to get some answers. Thank you for listening, and please come along to see me and my samples if you have any further questions. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.